for event two, I think that's information is very clear. Um, because of our really uh, high expectations, really outstanding benefits. Um, to help us think about how the challenges in the traditional university model um, are being met um, and, and the challenges that we pose in certain ways. Um, it's also happy, helping us, I think, to envision where the opportunities are for us to innovate. Today, uh, for those of you who were around last night, we had an amazing session um, and uh, uh, very, very concrete with uh, Al Kilreese and Rebecca Frickin. Al teaches a course to 35,000 students uh, in Penn on poetry. Um, and uh, so I always keep it with him. Um, uh, Rebecca Frickin is doing all this interesting work as a consultant on how education is moves for traditional universities. Um, she's working with the University of Maryland system right now. And today, the special treat is by really the two pioneers, so, uh, the philosophers of the moves. They actually taught the first move um, ever in 2008. That's a phenomenon that's gone on for the last year or two, which is on Actually, no, it's been going on for a lot longer than that. And we were antecedents to the 2008 uh, move that they put together. Um, Stephen Downs uh, is, is here with us. I'm going to allow both of them to give the a little bit more detail about what uh, they come from and who they are. They're both very established researchers uh, in Canada. They've done a tremendous amount of writing. Not only on moves, but on learning and on technologically mediated learning, and are very thoughtful about pedagogical issues around teaching uh, massive amounts uh, of people. These are network effects that come to the site when you do that. What I'd like to do today, this morning we had a session that was very interesting. Um, we had the students go after each other on, uh, uh, over a number of ideas. It was a fascinating debate. Um, what we'd like to do here is to think a little, a little bit about the future of the university in relation to the moves, the sort of future of the university. And where are moves going? Right? What we've heard in the last 24 hours is there is not one monolithic thing for moves. There are many different kinds of moves. Um, and moves as we see them now as and hermetically sealed monolithic things are in fact going to more to turn into other kinds of uh, teaching and learning experiences that will influence universities in the future. So I'm going to allow each of our uh, speakers to talk for maybe 10 minutes, about 10 minutes, of briefly introduce themselves and, uh, and present their view on where moves are and kind of where they're going and the implications for universities. That will take about 20 minutes. Then we're just going to sit down and we'll have a informal discussion. Um, I hope many of you will uh, just ask questions. And so with that, um, I'd like to ask George, um, George Siemens, to come up and talk for a bit. Hey, okay, well, thank you. And first of all, uh, I just want to say thanks as well to, to Randy for uh, hosting us and for raising the, uh, the conversation on the importance of different ways of thinking about teaching and learning and what's becoming a fairly rapidly developing narrative, if you will, in terms of the future of education, the future of higher education. A lot of that narrative is framed in the language of dramatic change, disruption, completely new reality and all of those wonderful things. Uh, some of you probably, if you've been in education for a while, uh, we do hear that every decade or so, so that we're, we're due. And uh, what I want to talk about specifically though is what are some of the change pressures that we're facing in the university context, uh, particularly what has given rise to the interest in MOOCs on a very broad level. And then I'll chat a little bit about perhaps what needs to happen for us to really make an impact. And then in the last minute and a half, I'll talk about uh, future uh, kind of examples of where the university might be heading long term. 
So fundamentally, the, the change that I would argue is that is underpinning much of what's happening in education, but also broadly within society. There's really two particular components, <laughs> one builds on the other. But we have a transition to a networked world, an explicitly networked world. It's always being networked. We just know that the networks have sort of been a little bit uh, confined due to geographic uh, space or limitations. And now with the internet, the provenance of mobile devices and so on, we have a completely different structure where we're globally connected. We have, uh, well, I mean, let's look at it from your master's experience, right? When you get your master's program, sitting in uh, a library, rifling through journals on shelves, trying to find that one or two citations that would make your text come alive. And literally, weekends that you could spend doing that and then trying to trace a network from, I read a citation in this article over here, now I've got to find it over there. And uh, versus today, Google Scholar. I mean, it's, it's just not fair that students would be able to <laughs> find articles and ideas that rapidly. What literally used to take me a weekend now takes someone a matter of five minutes. So that's a fact. So that's, that's the function of a network world where information is connected. This goes back to Vannevar Bush, but even prior to that, Paul Outlet and others that have written about network information structures. The, the, what builds on that, or the second part that builds on it, it comes fractured from a text, and if you're interested, it's, I certainly recommend it. It's called Reinventing Knowledge by McNeil and Wolverton. And they make what's, I think, a very accurate argument, which is that historically, the knowledge institution of society trace what a society does with knowledge. So if you want to understand what the university will look like in the future, what's most important is to understand what we're doing with information today. Because the institution of tomorrow will have to mirror the way in which information is created, disseminated, and shared within the broader society today. And so the difficulty comes in when you start talking about these network models is that network information doesn't have a center. So it's not like a university course, for example. Right, where you can go and this is the course and these are the readings. When you start talking about network information, you actually end up with a completely different model where individuals uh, encounter information in bits and pieces. It's distributed. It is scattered across a variety of different uh, sources of media. A student that's in your classroom today taking a statistics class might be uh, part of, you know, finding some help resources through, through the CMU statistics uh, site. They might be taking a course online through Rice or through Sailor, accessing open content. Maybe they enrolled in the edX course in statistics that just started yesterday. Uh, and so when your students are coming to your classroom, they're not coming there exclusively to listen to what you have to tell them about that subject. They're coming there in many ways to integrate many different pieces that they've encountered from a variety of different places. Now they're trying to make sense of what it means. And part of your role as a faculty member is to help them make those connections between those very fragmentary information source that they encounter. So that's sort of the reality. Network information doesn't have a center, and we need to stop thinking in terms of centers. And a center is a book, or a center is a course. Now, looking broadly, then, what are some of the, the substantive changes that are happening that impact uh, the universities that MOOCs are to some level at least a response to? This isn't exclusively <coughs> the driving factors. It is the change structure of information, increased attention uh, to the technological components that exist in every ubiquity of technology, really, in everyone's life. But there's a few changes going on that are, are worth thinking about. One, in a transition to a knowledge economy, the fastest growing segment of our learner base today are non-traditional learners in all sections of the university. If you look at reports that track enrollment forecast growth in society, uh, the fastest growing by far is online learning or some kind of that, that segment of the market is expected globally to increase around 35% over the next uh, 40 years. Whereas the traditional university market, and that's a, that's a compound annual growth rate, so we're talking year over year increase, uh, where you're looking at um, other sectors that are running low single digits as traditional universities. So much slower growth rate, and this is validated with uh, the slow and seed reports that's been going on for over a decade. They show Slightly lower numbers, but then that's because the U.S. is further ahead than the global areas for online adoption. So they're showing something that's in the 20% range for future online. But that's a big factor. So what we're seeing is traditional students are now coming in, or non-traditional students are now growing part of the education sector. The university has to sort of adapt, adjust or adapt to what that might look like. Another aspect that's uh, significant, and I think this is going to be something the university has to face, really quickly, and this is one of the biggest drawbacks of MOOCs right now, the way that they're being presented by edX and Coursera and Udacity. 
the unit of knowledge for learning or the unit of learning for knowledge acquisition is fragmenting and it's becoming much, much smaller. It's no longer a course. I think it's going to be a competency in the long run. So instead of courses, we'll be talking competencies. And it'll become more important that universities find ways to track competency structure rather than track students in the course. So that's one aspect to think about. And as a result of that shift to a more granular learning uh, object, oh, that's the wrong word. I'm going to rephrase that. Learning object. <laughs> the shift to a more granular content unit in the learning process is, uh, has a, a, a series of fairly significant implications. One is greater attention to personalization and adaptation. Now, this is where companies such as Newton and Pierce and others who are invested heavily. As content is opening up and teaching is opening up, existing publishers and university systems are trying to find a new value point. That new value point, not surprisingly, is in lock-in through personalization, adaptation, and analytics. So I'm going to cluster those three ideas together. Uh, by giving students, so right now we've got, you know, let's say there's 30 people in this room. Those 30 people, you're each hearing the same words that I'm speaking, but they resonate with you differently because all of you have a different existing knowledge profile, which means there are certain points that you're listening and you're disagreeing, uh, something you might agree with, and so on, and that's normal in a classroom. Your students, especially now that they come from a fragmentary knowledge background, they're coming at it very, very differently, and that requires that the system itself somehow account for what do students already know, what have they learned at other sources, and how can we track that. Um, so in addition to the personalization adaptation analytics, there's also the notion of alternative assessment models. The University of Wisconsin recently announced a bachelor's program that required zero in-time class and zero online class activity. It was essentially a prior learning recognition or prior learning assessment recognition, depending on how you use it. Uh, approach to learning. So you can learn wherever you want to learn, however you want to learn. They didn't care at the end of the day, demonstrate you require that competence and give you a degree for it. And that, especially because we have this changing learner profile, non traditional learner, uh, often coming back to university after they've been in industry for a while, they come with a breadth of knowledge that we haven't seen in sequential students from high school on. So that's another big factor to keep aware of, or to, to be uh, informed about is alternative assessment models. The final aspect is just general openness. There's growing interest. Scholars, researchers, academics who do a lot of the peer review work in journals, they're realizing, wait a second, let's think this through. I write an article for free. I submit it to the journal. The journal will then hire a group of my academic peers, and by hire I mean pay them nothing, to review <laughs> that journal. And then that article that I wrote that my peers evaluate for free will be sold back to my university. There's something about that model that doesn't quite make sense. So there's going to be a huge <coughs> in open scholarship, open teaching, open online learning. And loops are part of that broader trajectory of openness in education, but they also have some roots in terms of the growing interest that's being paid to developing uh, new models of responding to fragments of information to the benefit of the internet in every aspect of our lives and so on. Okay, so final couple quick points I just want to touch on is the sort of the future of the university. If you've been in education for a while, as I mentioned earlier, you see this cycle of this is the big new thing, this is the big new thing. Uh, we had that with TVs and classrooms, and we had that in the past with radio instruction. At one point it was distance education, it was, you know, the list goes on. There's always a big new thing in education. And uh, that means that the question from an educational end is are MOOCs different? Or is it just another tool in the long list of hype tools? And uh, my argument is, I genuinely believe that we are in the period of a very substantial transformation that make MOOCs relevant. And they're not relevant because they're MOOCs, but they're relevant because they're reflective of the broader change in society moving towards network structures, participatory systems, social systems in society, self-organizing social systems. So the reason that MOOCs are relevant and important is not because they're a new tool in education, but it's because they reflect a new mindset broadly within society around how we think about information, how we connect with one another, how we create, how we share. So I'll leave it there. Turn over. I think Stephen's going to come up next and do a quick chat, and then we'll talk a little bit more related to, I guess, later on potential future scenarios because that's certainly an important point to this. Great. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Stephen Downs. You may know. I uh, live and work in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. 
If you're wondering where that is, there's Maine, and right to the east of it is New Brunswick, and I'm here. So, they're freckled from this one. Uh, I worked as a, a researcher in the field of online learning and new media. I've worked with them since 2001. As George said, uh, we've gone through different iterations in our field from uh, learning objects, the words which we will not speak anymore of, uh, <laughs> to e learning 2.0, and these days MOOCs, and it's all part of the transition. I want to focus on what the future of MOOCs is, and I wanted to put it into a direct and meaningful context. And when I'm asked to do that, I generally ask people to reflect on their own learning, their own professional development, how they keep up with knowledge in their own field, how they keep up with how to be a good teacher, a good instructor, a good art historian, whatever. I don't know anything about art history, but I can make the case from the perspective of art history. And suppose you are an art historian, you've gone through your 10 years of university and you're a professor in the university now, and you know people think, may think of art history as a static discipline. I mean, Guernica is Guernica, it's not going to change, we hope. Uh, but, but I think in any discipline we see at one speed or another, constantly evolving beliefs, theories, conversations, background knowledge. No matter what your discipline is, even if it's art history, you still have to keep current in it. And if you're a professor in art history, you have to keep current in how to be a professor generically. Um, when you started, if you started, when I started, uh, Whiteboards were the new thing. They were the big thing. They they were because because well there was no chalk dusting. I grew up on, I grew up on chalkboards and resisted mightily, and I still resist the whiteboard because it's just wrong. <laughs> but you know you have to keep up because you're right. Overhead projectors, you have to understand how to use PowerPoint uh, or not use PowerPoint, whatever the case may be. So, how do you do that? Well, you don't go take another university degree because that would be, well, stupid. Uh, you're a professional now, and you're in the middle of your You don't even have the time to take a full class. It's interesting. You know, maybe, maybe you can take an online class, but generally you're looking at learning in a much more fluid, much more dynamic kind of way. When you're an art historian, you're a professor, what do you actually do? I'll put it in one simple nutshell. You talk to other art historians, right? That's your main way of learning. If you want to reduce it to a simple thing, it's you talk to other artists. Connectivism, which George has talked about a lot and I have talked about a lot, really reduces to you talk to other artists. There's a lot of infrastructure, especially today, with all kinds of ways of talking to other artists. It used to be. You know, and again, you know, when I was just starting out, I was in philosophy, and uh, I went to my first philosophy conference in Saskatoon, five hours by bus from Calgary, in winter, uh, in Alberta, <laughs> um, and went to a small room where there were six people that I read my paper, word for word, and that was how we did it. Um, now. If I wanted to do the same thing, I'd just post a blog post. And, and you begin to see the different dynamics kind of happening. We're much more connected, we're much more interactive, we're much more communicative. So much so that we don't just depend 
on the existing network structures of conferences and journal articles and faculty meetings and things like that. Now we're responsible for creating and managing our own networks. And that is the new way of learning. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about MOOCs and when we talk about connectivism. Forget the whole course time thing. Managing and creating our own networks. So how do we do it? How does the art historian today do it? I have, in my own way, I've described four, four principles for successful networks. And these four principles are derived from network theory. They're not original to me. If you read James Sorichi, you'll see some of them. If you read the of the structure of scientific revolution, you'll see some of them. But here are the four principles. Autonomy, diversity, interaction, interactivity, and openness. I won't deal with the matter of it. But let's start with diversity. Do you want to hear only from the castle scholars? Or do you want to hear from people who like Rembrandt as well? I don't know. I don't know. But, but you want. The diversity of voices speaking. We want people who love expressionism, people who love expressionism, and people who love expressionism. Uh, right. You don't want to hear the same message from the people you talk to. The same theoretical You don't even want them to see the field of our history the same way you do. In fact, if you think about it, you can't have conversation if everybody is saying the same thing. It's not possible. It just becomes like a chance session. So the first <laughs> principle in being able to learn through conversations with colleagues is diversity. Trying to get as many different sources as possible. We extend that. And in the online world, we think of diversity not just uh, you know, not just background, not just interest, not just language, but even things that like class will talk to you even if you're a match person, or even if you're a PC person, or God help us, even if you're a Linux person, we'll still talk to you. Um, we'll talk to you if you prefer programming in Java. Um, you know. So that's the first principle. Second principle is autonomy. It's really important. It's, it's one of these underrepresented or, or what's the word I'm looking for? Undercredited, <laughs> undervalued uh, element uh, of being a scholar, uh, of being a learner in any discipline. Now, we, we talked about academic freedom and all of that. The reason why that's important is to support the autonomy of individuals. And the reason why the autonomy of individuals is important is because that is the only way we're going to create diversity. That is the only way we're going to get these diversities. Having interesting conversations results from Some sameness, some syntactical sameness, so that we can actually interact. And Jordan might even say there has to be some directness. But fundamentally, if you want learning to occur, the core value of Think about it from your own perspective as a professor of art history. You are trying to maintain your professional career. Is it better for you to choose? The learning, the sources of learning, the goals of learning, the objectives of learning, or to have them assigned to you by a manager. Which kind of learning would be better? I argue that it would be a time. Next one is openness. And you know, from a, from being open to experience, being open to ideas. From the perspective of a network, it's 
having new people come into the network, allowing people to leave the network. From the perspective of concepts, it's bringing information in, sending information out. It's this whole idea of dynamic, of dynamic interaction of flow, of growth, of development. Openness is what makes that possible. From the perspective of being a personal learner, it means being able to access the resources that are in. Uh, me, I don't have piles of money, so I go after open, openly accessible materials, especially today. In a journal article, if I read a journal article online, it cost me thirty dollars. I would be broke before I finished my first research at those rates. So I look for open online sources. George talked a bit about the economics of open Really practical. I can't learn unless the content is open because I can't afford to do otherwise. I think it's a fundamental principle. The fourth thing is interactivity. Partially that's the idea of learning as a conversation. You learn by talking to each other. But the other part of that is the conversation isn't just Fred says Jernica is great and that message propagates through the community. Rather, if Fred says something about Jernica, Jill says something about Jernica, and the result of that interaction is some knowledge that none of us have at the start of the day. See the difference between the propagation of knowledge and emergent knowledge. And the model of learning here is emergent knowledge. You, as a community, create new knowledge by interaction rather than transmitting interaction, or transmitting knowledge through interaction. Okay, so to wrap up, which will still take a few minutes, but I'd I like to address the future of the MOOC now from this perspective. We have Udacity, Coursera, edX, the elites, if you will, and they're propagating right now even this model of open online learning is like the Napster of learning, where there'd be a whole bunch of companies the mass is like nano from the elite network. But I don't think it's going to work that way because that's not how we learn. That's not the model I just described, is it? Taking, you know, Jennings. It's part of the model. The resources are useful. The videos, if you have time, uh, are useful. Although, you know, I'd rather have something I can read in five minutes than a video I have to watch for 50, but that's just me. But what's missing in that you know, received model, which is very new, is the whole community, the whole interaction thing. The future of MOOCs is community. Uh, the MOOCs that, that George and I started are, are, were basically our community coming into itself and organizing itself. What we did when we built a MOOC is we created a mechanism and an environment for a community to organize itself. And then our fundamental message, in addition to saying, well, we're going to talk about connectivism, you guys can join along, was if you do, organize yourself. We're not going to manage your learning. You manage your learning. We'll provide the space. We'll provide you know, some, some technical support to help you interact and all of that, um, and the software we provided did that. But what we did not do is try to organize groups. If people wanted to form groups, they did. If they didn't want to form groups, they didn't. If they wanted to agree with us, they did. If they didn't want to agree with us, they really, really didn't. And that was OK. So it's this idea of community, but not community in this traditional sense where the mayor and counselors and they define the purpose of the community and that it's all organized from the top down. It's community in the sense of self-organizing online community. Community in the sense of cooperation, where each person 
acts autonomously and independently and exchanges with other people rather than collaborating with <laughs> So, one last thing for you. Where is university education going in this context? Well, the traditional functions of the university um, teaching, credentialing, and there's research. And, it's, and maybe a fourth implicit function is community. And I'm, I'm just thinking of this idea but these three traditional functions are all under threat by this new model. Especially credentialing. Credentialing is what produces the revenue that subsidizes everything else. Because if university didn't have the stranglehold on degrees, they would have a very difficult time charging 30, 40, whatever for a degree. People talk about MOOCs, they talk about badges, they talk about alternative forms of credentialing. But think about this. Learning is a conversation. The way you learn to be an art historian is you talk to other art historians. <laughs> Ask yourself now, how do these other art historians know that you are an art historian? Well, they might check your degrees, but that never happens, right? When you have a conversation with another art historian, they don't say, well, what are your degrees? They don't grow you that. Sometimes people kind of like make a bit of a show of presenting their degree business. I am doctor so and so rather than just I'm so and so. But most of the time there there is no prior assessment happening. So how do they know you're an art historian? Well, what you're doing when you're communicating with them is you're producing artifacts. Generally in the traditional learning system, linguistic artifacts. Now that we can do video and audio and all that, you're producing multimedia artifacts, but you're producing a whole range of artifacts which are evidence of your capacity as an art historian. Why do we know it's evidence of your capacity as an art historian? Because you're practicing art history, the actual real discipline, in the art historian community. Other people in the community don't look at your credentials. They don't look at your badges or other shortcuts. They look at the artifacts that you produce, and then they literally recognize that you are an art historian. You know, what does that mean? We can boil it down. You use the right words in the right way. Uh, you refer to Guernica as though it were a painting and not an animal. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, there's a little whole bunch of signs and subtle signals. Cognitively, mentally, the process is literally exactly the same. The same mechanisms are happening in your brain as when you recognize a friend you know in the airport. Same thing. So, previously that was really hard to do because it was hard to have these conversations. That's why the philosophy that this tradition in the US, the philosophy smoker. Horrible, horrible abomination. But the idea was to get novice philosophers into a big smoke-filled room with expert philosophers and have them have conversations with the experts and say, you know, that guy really does know comments after all. Or, you know, he, he's a Hegelian. I know he's a Hegelian. He may deny it, but he just pulled that sentence up. See how I'm demonstrating my, my chops and philosophy? Uh, now, we don't have to do that. Now, all of these artifacts are open. They're online in these massive open online courses. They're not just places where you can learn, they're places where you prove yourself. And you prove yourself not by accumulating badges, but by creating artifacts of your own learning. These artifacts are part of the conversation, part of the interaction. In the future, we will be able to short the entire because we understand what the structure is of that recognition. We understand the mathematics of it, we understand 
how it works computationally. Mathematically, it's graph theory. Computationally, it's connectionism. Um, if we want to build a system for recognizing competences, you build a neural network that looks at what people do in the community and spots clusters and places people according to those clusters. So that's where groups are heading in the future. Where does the university head? Well, could become a credential thing. Could become a research thing, it could become a teaching thing, but if it wants to be successful, ultimately, it would need to become a community thing. That's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too long. I'm sorry. Um, oh, yeah, in this center. Yeah, yeah. You don't know whenever you're. Whenever you're with uh, Stephen Downs, you're on a repeat webcast. So, hi, everybody. <laughs> I think we have one viewer. Yeah, yeah one viewer. Yeah. I, you know, it was really interesting listening, listening to both of you. We had a fascinating first session, by the way, uh, this morning on pedagogy. But I'm kind of thinking about the transformation imperative series in general and picking up on a couple of themes. One theme. Um, which both of you brought up and had very different perspectives on was the issue of, of credentialing. And I, I mentioned to both of you that we did have really a couple fascinating days on the Open Badge movement and the idea of stackable credentials or credentialing knowledge sort of um, as its master. And um, uh, looking really at A, practically how that's done, and B, if that would pose a challenge to the traditional BA or undergraduate degree, the monolithic degree, and the transfer. Um, I would love to hear more about your thoughts about, and you're right, it is fundamental to the future of the university. It really is. This issue of credentialing is kind of it on, on one level when you talk about the model. Um, but I'm also interested in looking forward to our next transformation imperative uh, uh, group of events, which I hope all of you will come to. Um, well, we bring in Robin Chase, of, of all people, I'll say, really after the people we brought in, who was the founder of uh, Zipcar. She founded a new company in France called Buzzcar. What Buzzcar <coughs> does is sell the open time in somebody's car to somebody else. And our cars are sitting empty, right, 95% of the time. Beautiful business model. So she put together a big company and got capitalized and all that stuff, launched it, had this whole sort of network thing going on out there, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. And she'll talk about it. it nothing happened because she didn't understand the dynamic of networks. And she talks about it in sort of an interesting way, which resonates beautifully with what you are talking about. That when she understood the power of the network, it was about the network evaluating itself. So different drivers in different cars, there was a system of evaluating how reliable, how good they were. There was a system who was understanding how the providers of the cars would innovate by jazzing up their cars in a certain way, making them, distinguishing them from one another. So there was a uh, 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 innovation, there was differentiation, uh, there was self-evaluation, um, and then looking at what the company would do. What was the role of the company there in providing, uh, for example, insurance? Uh, providing all the things that, that individuals can. Uh, the stability, the sort of basic infrastructure, the insurance, all those long-term things that make the network work. So I'm a provost. I'm listening to both of you, and I'm thinking network, meaning a peer network. She calls, by the way, this it's called Peers Incorporated, this model. Um, we're looking at a university with students, potentially, as the network, on campus and beyond campus. In the case of a move, it's way beyond campus. It's everywhere. But looking at it in terms of campus, um, and then you have the role of the university in terms of enabling that network and extracting the most value as you possibly can out of that network. 
I'm really interested. I know it's a really broad area, but before I open it up, great things about being moderators, I can always get to ask the first questions. But I'd be really interested in your thoughts on either of the credentialing side and how in the future of universities of credentialing, based on MOOC and MOOC, the, uh, what's going to happen, what MOOCs will morph into, maybe, and then the issue of peer networks and institutions. Well, I mean, on the first part, uh, well, actually, they're connected. But first of all, I will say the model of MOOCs that we see right now with edX and Coursera uh, are a regression of about 15 years worth of our understanding of learning online. Yeah. Uh, they are not an advancement the way that they're being forecast. The advancement that they offer is actually this combination of multiple universities contributing to learning online platform. But the pedagogical experience is actually a significant regression about quality. So I don't think the model of MOOCs that you see right now have a big future. They have to change. And the reason they don't have a big future, and the lead-in that you provide with Robin Chase I think is perfect, is that they are actually network antagonistic. The current MOOC model is, if anything, a uh, sort of solidification of traditional control structures. And uh, so that's one, one component to think about. What will be more Realistic in the future, I think I mentioned earlier about competencies. I think competencies really is what we have to start thinking. Or something like competencies. In a university, we're much more important people than the low life sound industry. So we don't use words like competency because it's too commercialized. We use outcomes. But it doesn't matter what language you use. The point is competencies. I mean, it's fine. Um, the point is that we have to start thinking in those granular units of learning. And the reason that that's important is it means from a credentialing end in the future we're not going to expect that one system will provide the range of credentialing. So if teaching and learning are, are uh, broken up from the uh, you know, current content development part of the university, in fact, the numbers range in scholarship and of research. So if we, if we fragment that particular experience, then the uh, teaching and learning doesn't matter where it happens. So it's this notion of moves as well. You know, teach globally credible. So it doesn't matter where you get your learning, but Philadelphia University will validate that. Uh, based on being able to manage or what you provide as indicators of your competence. And that would be where the credit will come from in that particular model. Uh, the networked approach, I really think it's important to recognize that if we talk about the future of the university, we have to throw an S in there. It really is about a futures of the university. There are too many, I mean, if you understand complexity theory, then you'll recognize the worst thing to do in a period of many variables being unconnected up in the air is to make a solid prediction. Because if you're right, you're lucky. If you're not, you weren't accurate, you were lucky. Right now we have everything up in the air. We have the credentialing model, we have the teaching model, we have the content model, we haven't even talked publishers like Pearson and We haven't talked about Blackboard and Desire to Learn and Canvas. Uh, they're all players in this space as well. And so they're by no means out. Right now the publicity of media is going to Coursera and these organizations. These are still, these companies are there, and they're, especially Pearson's case, they're billions of dollars deep. So that's another aspect to think about as well, is that the future of the university uh, is going to be, it's impossible to predict from where we're sitting today because of so many unsettled variables or so many unsettled components. But if I was to say very, very broadly, what I stated earlier is, think about what we're doing with information. Because that's what the university will eventually have to reflect. How are we creating socially distributed? It's participative. It's uh, done according. It's globally. It, it's, it doesn't happen in one set space. There's many voices. The way that ideas are evaluated is through discourse and debate rather than through I said so because I'm. Uh, so those are, those are some of the factors that we can say that is what the system will look like. Uh, because at this point, I would comfortably say that if you're fighting the network in the long run. You're yeah, um, I'll give you the first thought that I had after you spoke, and then try to develop it. And, 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 and I don't mean that as flippantly as it sounds, but, but the first thought that I had, because you, you tied it a lot to the future of the university, and the university. It offers degrees, it offers learning, it offers research, but what it trades in really is in exclusivity and scarcity. And you know, there's a reason why Yale is Yale. 
And the reason why Yale is Yale is not because the professors are so great, uh, but because it's really hard to get into. But it's really hard to get into for people like me, but not really hard to get into for the people who actually get into it. And what makes Yale, Yale is the fact that it creates this social structure inside the university. It, it ignore all of the learning and that, yeah, it needs to provide learning. You know, it needs to, to actually offer some value to the people who are there, to attract them there. But what makes Yale, Yale isn't so much the people who get into it, but the fact that most people don't. Um, a lot of discussions about what would work in universities, even when they become student-focused, look at the current student body of <coughs> universities. And you know, that current that student body is and is becoming more uh, upper income, already skilled, computer literate, um, motivated, etc. All those different things, right? All of the things that, that people who aren't in the university are. But, 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 rapid, aren't, at least aren't thought to be really are um, in their own way. What the MOOC tells us is that, you know, I, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people signing up for these things tells us is that. There's a certain fundamental flaw in this model of the university as purveyors of exclusivity. Right? Uh, and the flaw is this. As universities became less exclusive over time, our capacities as a society increased. And the capacities of individuals who were able to attend university increased. The GI Bill is the greatest socialist experiment in American history, probably. And, and what it did is it created all of these new university graduates. And, and you look at you know, the resulting flourishing of innovation, knowledge, research, uh, economics, etc. But the problem is the model was built and structured financially to serve you know, originally only the wealthy. And then you know the, the kind of more wealthy, etc. The MOOC tells us that we need to reshape this model so that the the clients, if you will, the, the customers, if you will, of the, the university are people of society as a whole, and not simply those who can afford to get in. And the other stakeholder business story that I don't even want to get into that. But this idea that you know, if you have enough money, you can buy what a university should be doing, direct its research, and all that. I mean, MOOCs argue against that. MOOCs argue for the, the fundamental social value of a knowledge and learning system that benefits everybody in society. And that's the real struggle universities will have. Thank you. I'd like to open up. That's, that's, I'd like to open up to the audience for uh, for questions. Yeah. I, I think, uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Last night was awesome. And this yeah, this session is also awesome. I uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to do this, but I decided to go ahead and do it. I want to add a little dimension to the conversation regarding what the universities do and the uh, uh, tremendous. I think it was you, Steve, that said, Steve, that said, uh, students make an investment. And they come to a university like Philadelphia. Well, Philadelphia University and other universities also then, they produce a product. I hate to say people are products, but just bear with me. Um, and that product is, in a lot of ways, like, is, is purchased by the economy. And that's the added dimension that we're, we're talking about fabulous economic concepts of learning and reaching the next Einstein who might be in the village in Nigeria. I don't know where that person is very powerful academic discussion. But a role that I see the university playing for some time uh, is re relative to credentialing because there's buyers of those credentials that they have to adapt by they, the companies that do all the hiring, have to adapt to a new system, say, generated by MOOCs, that are now delivering a different product. 
where are they going to, how are they going to be convinced that they're hiring what they want? Well, I, I know part of the answer is because of the artifacts that people carry with them. But those artifacts to enter a field, a business career, has to have a set of characteristic skills. That's kind of a cold word, but skills. I think a university in a MOOC scenario can be very helpful in delivering and facilitating that process. So it's a third party using all of these fabulous outcomes that you guys are talking about. See, there used to be travel agents. And we now have mechanisms that allow us to book our travel by ourselves virtually automatically. And the market disappeared for travel agents. I know there's still some out there because they still get hired by universities and governments. But, but I mean, but from the point of view of personal travel, the travel agents almost irrelevant. Imagine somebody came up with software and we could talk about what it would look like. I actually could talk about what it would look like, sadly. <laughs> but that would replace the need for credentials. Um, so that take a person and some reasonably secure identifier for this person and, and we're moving more and more in that direction. Um, and this piece of software can tell you what their credentials are. Even though they don't have a degree, even though they haven't been given a, a bachelor's or whatever, and, and more to the point, you can ask this software, could this person pro program in Python? And the computer says, yes, it's up to such a one. Uh, is this person a qualified art historian? And, and the program comes back, yes, this person could teach at a bachelor's level, but not a master's level. Um, what then are universities selling to these customers? And, you know, I, I sketched that as, possibility, but it's theoretically possible. I know what the software would look like, and if I can imagine it, real programmers will imagine it. And, you know, it's true that you can't predict the future, but, you know, if a rock is rolling down a hill, you might not know exactly where it's going to land, but it's not going to be back at the top of the hill. It's going to be somewhat soft, and we're in that kind of environment. So that's, you know, I really, you know, universities depend so much on this monopoly of the credential or even the, capa the capacity to sell the credential. That's going to end. And, and period, end of story. I'll get you just a minute to see if you have any response to that. You know, I, I, I uh, this came out of some of conversation earlier, so I do see the thing, uh, the situation, in some ways, I think what Steve's getting at, but the credential ending, I 100% agree that the credential exclusivity of the university has a shelf life. And, and when you consider what's happened, let's say, with Microsoft certified program, there's always been a shadow or a peripheral way by which you can be validated as being competent by someone. And so it's, exactly. So it's not, it isn't exclusively the domain of university, but it's just that it's becoming even less so going forward. And you can, let's see, of course, with Audacity, you can go to a Pearson Testing Center and get a uh, get stamp that says you're fine. So what won't change, though, is that some level of accreditation will still be there. So when I'm talking about no more credential, what we're essentially talking about is different types of and I'm not entirely comfortable with that either, but you don't have to be comfortable with the trend in order for it to be a reality. Uh, and the reason being that I think what will eventually end up becoming is the for profit space will become dominant in the culture yeah, space. Right. And uh, so this is something that I'm, I'm fairly concerned about is I think we are witnessing a stunning period of change in education, and I don't think it is going well for the university, and I don't think it's going well for the society. The reason it's not going well, it's going great for the for profit sector, and it will continue to go great. The reason is that most faculty have been intentionally ignorant of trends in online learning. Um, I speak with universities right now regularly, and just recently spoke with a group. So they're now setting up, I'm working with them to set up a, 
a department that's focused on uh, online learning excellence within the university. And one of the things that's coming out of it is they historically they've ignored the online trend, ignored it, ignored it. But the skills needed to be competent. They look back and they take stock and they say, my goodness, we have no competency in this online game. We're going to have to buy Pierce's product because that way we can play with the current space. But that's what we have to do in order to stay relevant because we forgot to build capacity 15 years ago. Now, that's exactly 100% what's happening. Each time somebody signs up with Coursera, uh, edX is different. edX I don't put in the same camp because edX is not profit. It's open source. It's a slightly different field. They, have, they are talking about it. But every time somebody signs up with Coursera, it is, a, it is for me a university president saying, we, we have stuff. We should have, but we didn't. So uh, the hell, I'm going to sign this thing and now we're part of Coursera. That's what every single signature means when I see that because it means the university says we can't do it on our own. And any university that's invested time and effort in building the vision can do it on their own. Hmm. So uh, the big part I think going forward with the credentialing, credentialing is not going away, it'll happen somewhere. What's going to be most critical, I think, is recognizing that one of the biggest values the university gives to a student right now is the integrative experience. Yeah. And so from a student's end, if you've taken an open online course, if you've tried to learn something, it's true, you go to Google and figure out stats. You don't like stats, you go to Google and figure out. But the problem is there's a lot of time hunting and seeking and finding and this and that. So if a university is willing to say, George, we know you are sort of network oriented as a learner, we know you've got a variety of skills and expertise, we want to make that experience less painful for you to come to the university to demonstrate your knowledge, demonstrate your capacity, we'll provide you an integrated experience, proper levels of support, adaptive list goes on. That's a product I'll buy. But the current economic proposition of the university as Stephen Moore is not a sustainable one. But this notion of a value add directly to the student rather than a value add to the employer, uh, namely the form of credential, that is something that uh, universities do have an opportunity. If they think it through and say, we can create this integrated experience where people are willing really to pay for it, because you can already get a lot of stuff for free that people pay for, and it's because they want that experience of pieces fitting together well without a lot of stress. Interesting. Yeah. How does the sort of accreditation you're talking about, these little sort of chunks and units that match up to particular skills, how is that not just a network name for standardized testing? And how do we avoid the pitfalls the standardized testing break? We've got the university sitting in the accreditation role, fighting with peers and over who gets to take that box. And then, but saying, well, wait, you know, University B down the road is moving its graduates through where they're getting an 80% credentialing rate. All the same things we've just seen that have you know, gone through with the high schools. Okay. I bet you have a lot to say about this. <laughs> and believe me, I am not even remotely a proponent of standardized testing. And so, there is a story behind that. Let's talk about open source software. Open source software exists in part because of a gift economy, but also in part because it's a great place for people who do not have jobs in the computing industry to do advanced software work. So what happens in open source software is many ideas are different projects, different things. They get, they get put into GitHub or whatever. And the community sometimes forms around and sometimes doesn't. A product sometimes comes out of it, sometimes doesn't. And you end up with, say, things like the, uh, the uh, uh, Firefox browser. Firefox browser is a marvel of software. The people who were the primary coders demonstrated not only advanced coding uh, credentials, but also the ability to, to manage and motivate a large software development team. They got jobs with Google. So, why did they get jobs with Google? Not because they had these degrees, but because these artifacts of their participation in the community were readily accessible and studyable by Google. So, your question to me is, how is that different from standardized testing? And it's different in every way imaginable. First of all, there's no test. Secondly, 
There's no standard against <coughs> which the test should be applied. Third, the thing being evaluated isn't even the thing, although there are various artifacts, but it's the whole aspect of the quality. And fourth, is a whole domain of inquiry that didn't even exist before the work got done. Was no Mozilla Foundation, et cetera, et cetera, before So it's exactly the opposite of standardized testing. It's, it's about as personalized as you get. It, it emphasizes creativity as much as you can get. And more to the point, it doesn't slice and dice and abstract complex knowledge into simple bits and pieces, but rather <coughs> it as a whole. Now the question now becomes, can software do that? And the answer to me is yes, because humans can do that, to recognize this kind of achievement, and we kind of have an understanding of how it is that humans do that through connectionist computational methodologies, pattern recognition. If you have some sense of what a great software engineer is, here's a person who kind of fits into that pattern, the better they fit into that pattern, partial pattern recognition, you have automated assessment of capacities and competencies. So, and I wanted to say this a bit earlier, but I'll give a chance. How does the university adapt to this? My answer would be, get out of the mindset that you're teaching subjects, like art history and philosophy and, and whatever, and start thinking along the lines that you're building these self-organizing communities, you're creating an environment for these self-organizing communities. This is a thing that MIT and Stanford and some of the universities in Finland do really well is, you know, I don't want to say it's project-based learning because it's not that. It's not even program-based learning, but, but it's like self-organized community-based learning. My personal experience in university was partially as a philosopher, <laughs> but I'll tell you, despite the fact that I was paying for a philosophy education, I spent, when I measured this, about two-thirds of my time at the student newspaper office. And that's where I got my university education. Fostering more of that and less of lectures and tests and assignments creates the environment like the open source software environment where people can practice and prove their capabilities. Virginia? Yeah. But do you agree? As long as the students are dependent on financial aid, who marks everything by course, by course, by course, I don't see how we will move that way. Because if, if students are going to pay, financial aid is checking satisfactory progress, course by course, by course. So, this is our answer. This is what we chatted about in our session earlier, which is that the, the system right now, it takes decades for a, probably even longer, but for a system to become structured in such a way that it begins to reinforce all parts of itself. Yeah. Now, what has, what we're talking about now with MOOCs, and this is why it's very difficult from an academic end and from the university end, to conceive of a reality different than the one we have. And, uh, I was briefly referred to something I've always been fascinated with. Stuart Hawkins, uh, he's an evolutionary biologist, and he's written about this notion of the adjacent possible. And what the adjacent possible in biological terms is, is that when a group of species or an environment and ecosystem comes to a certain stage, the next stage of transition just kind of makes sense because of where it is. So when I think we're in a knowledge domain, this is why a lot of people simultaneously invented the phone, or uh, you know, some of the work that Einstein was doing. He was not the sole person that got them for many people that sort of got to a similar place. And that's because as a domain hits a certain, a knowledge domain hits a certain space, we all arrive there at similar levels. And so with loops right now, we're getting to the point where the discussion has finally, after well over a decade of discussion about the impact of networks, digital media, and the internet of education, finally a stage now where literally we can see a different reality that we couldn't see five years ago. 
And as a result of being able to see different realities, suddenly it's like, oh, maybe we could do that with badges. Or, you know, maybe we could offer accreditation or we could offer credit for coursework in a way that's not through credit applications. The difficulty, though, is exactly the systems we're talking about. The system that we have now with financial aid and other areas, it reinforces the model that's been the case for a long time. It's going to take time for that model economically to change, but I believe to a large level the change is developing in a variety of sectors, and it's not something that you can help us stop to. So, University of San Jose, let's say, that signed that agreement with uh, Udacity to offer instead of you know, whatever it was, $1,500 or $1,000 for a course, they're now doing it online for $100. That changes the structure quickly. Government agencies pay attention, student aid groups are, you know, they, they call for reform and so on and so on. So I think we're at the early stages of those because we're talking policy and bureaucratic issues that rise well above the old individual university. So you end up at a point where you have to start playing at multiple games. You know, on the one hand, you have to keep your foot in the system that pays the bills, but you also have to be experimental enough so that you aren't Anchoring future transitions. It's much like, lack of a better word, a legacy software transition. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been involved in one of those hellish experiences, but you really have to think in two worlds the existing legacy system, but realizing that there's a fairly significant change coming. Not everything is lined up yet, a few more pieces have to fall into place, but this is where we are. But this is very, I mean, it's a great, great question, really. It's very concrete. And I think it does get at a lot of issues, and one of the things that are really interesting about some of these transformative uh, uh, changes that are going on, looking at different forms of credential and form moves, is that uh, many of them right now are, they're not credit bearing. They're not, the MOOCs aren't about that. The MOOCs are free. Um, the Mozilla Open Badge system, for the most part, if you look at how it's used in many cases, people aren't badging credits. They could, but that's not really how it's happening yet. There's a sort of experimentation that's taking place that's really fascinating, and I think we we need to pay attention to colleges and universities need to pay attention to and play with it while we're sort of this, this transition. I love the legacy software transition metaphor. If you ever got from like data tell the banner, you know, one of these, it's just hell. Well, everything, all the rules change. All the rules change. And the other thing that's worth emphasizing is we're at a period of really fascinating experimentation. Like literally every, you know, you wake up the next morning and it's like, well, what tectonic shift in the world was happening last night? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's worth thinking about as well that the, uh, the credit bearing aspect is being addressed by some groups. Some yeah, groups sure. are giving their yeah. credit. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we're, we're all yeah. trying to find our way. And it's, this is the huge benefit. There's the, uh, the work around complexity theory, in particular, is informative in that all it takes is you, know, you get a variety of experimentation, experiments going on simultaneously. The one that starts to show promise, people gravitate towards right. to nurture it, and it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And that's what we're going to see at work with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Matt. So, yeah. Matt Baker is executive dean of College of uh, Science, Health, and Liberal Arts. Yeah, we're trying to figure out is this gap between the pedagogical and the learning model and the business model. So it's sort of a, an interesting gap for like Facebook. They figured out how the thing would work before how it would make money. But over the last few months, you know, this is what I'm following. The three big players, um, sort of ship zero, um, Dacity and edX, are now trying to figure out that model. And some of that appears somewhat scary. This relationship with book companies and Pearson's, it's just sort of interesting to sort of get your view on where that's moving. Well, they want to commercialize, right? They want to privatize and commercialize education, very advanced, because there's so much money in it. Mostly money from government, but also some money from students. Uh, and that's, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, I, I think, personally, I think they're trying to monetize too soon. Uh, I think getting venture capital, especially at the levels they got, there's early in the game is probably a mistake. I mean, they got venture capital before they even had the user base. Um, yeah, so they got venture capital at a time when they literally had nothing to sell. 
So they have to do a really quick turnaround on this. And I really think that was a mistake. But the model uh, is, it, it's, it's not a natural model, but it's like, it's not even an eBay model. Probably the best model that I can think of that they're trying to go after is iTunes or Netflix. So maybe not that. But they, they're, they're trying to cash in on the brokering of commercial content, where the commercial content is necessary in order to achieve a desired education. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the model that funds education in the long term. I don't think it should be. <laughs> it is the, the corporate equivalent of the professor in Coursera actually pretty much requiring that students buy the 67 hour textbooks that were the success of the course. And calling that open, that's what it shows me. Mm -hmm. And one thing you know, on that part as well, I think so critical that we keep a focus on is what do networks do? I mean, we, we talk about networks in glowing terms. How wonderful. The connotations are almost always positive. Networks eviscerate traditional fields. Networks make many, make a handful of kings and tens of thousands of losers. And uh, that, that, from a university perspective, there's been some talk coming out of this with uh, you know, advocates for the MOOC format. Even Clayton Christensen of his disruption fame is saying, you know, give it 15 years, we're going to have half the university in the US, we're going to shut so, yes. in the front. Yeah, that was uh, as of yesterday. Then you have other folks. I mean, Sebastian Proof, he denies it now, but for you to ask him, he said, in, you know, 20 years or whatever, there'll be 10 universities in the world and there'll be one. Um, he, he says he didn't make that quote. <laughs> but that is what networks do. Like, you know, let's face it, there's a reason why we don't use 20 different search engines every day. We use Google. There, you know, so be aware when we start talking about network effects. Of now, this isn't a predestined solution. This is why back we have to be aware and be proactive. But it's it's that's what will happen with the network model as we keep going down the path. Is there will be more and more big winners. We're already talking about the big three. But but um, <clears throat> you're you're absolutely right when you say network produce these big winners, and it's it's the power law effect. Tony Church has described it. Uh, you know, we have a Google one site, 10 million users, and you get to my site, fewer, and then to you know, a friend's site with one user. And then the long tail, as they call it. That's what happens in a scale free map. The purpose of the four criteria that I described autonomy, diversity, openness, and neutrality are constraints on the map. And the intent of these constraints is to make them so that they're not scale threes, but rather they're scale sensitive. That it becomes harder and harder and harder to, to be the dominant player in one of these things. The problem is, of course, there are annexes and Udacity. They don't want those factors. No. That's why they don't have diversity. That's why they don't have autonomy. But we do. I think that there's so many yeah, hands up at the moment. Um,
my, my approach is, and I, I have it in slow form, so I'll do it in slow form. Uh, we see the future the way we see the past, the past. We're reading the signs. Right? Uh, for, prognostication is, is a form of knowledge creation. It's a form of recognition. And, yeah, you look at the signs. You know, if you're predicting the weather, you look at the barometric pressure, you look at the cloud cover things generally. It's not like you have a rain scenario, and a sun scenario, a snow scenario, and a hurricane scenario. You see it's going to rain. So look at the signs. Right? And that's where you get your business models from. Now I know that's really vague, really obscure. Um, the signs tell me this. Tell me this. Let me tell you something different, but I bet you they don't. Because we're living in the same climate. Um, the, the one sized fit all role of the educator is going to be unbundled. Uh, right now, educators are jack of all trades. Think, think of what they do, right? You have everything from uh, you know, society management to orchestration to content creation to lecturing to grading. That's not going to be the case in the future. It, it's going to fall apart. It's going to fall apart because. It's, it's one of these bottlenecks, these, these bottlenecks that really make it difficult to educate everybody instead of you know, the, the small elite that can afford to buy a personal chair. So, look at the different roles that you can possibly imagine will come up in the future and pick one. And then the business model there is join that community, identify value in that community. It's not that, 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 that really vague, but you know, I've got a presentation where I have like 25 distinct models, so I won't give you all of them. But, but you know, 